Hello. Today in quarantine news, we've reached the point in quarantine where I've remembered that I have a flute in my closet. Um, and I found out that I can still play the flute. Like, I remember a lot. Like, the muscle memory of, like, the finger positionings is actually, like, pretty good. Like, I haven't probably touched the flute in three or four years to be generous. Like, maybe, maybe more. Maybe, like, four or five. I don't even know. But I pulled it back out, and, like, I'm not good. <laughs> and, like, I can't really reach the high notes right now because I haven't done it in a while. But I remember how to do it, and I can, like, play a song. Not well, and not all the way through because I, like, the little tenses get all confused. Um, so I want to play it, but I'm worried that I'm going to annoy my family. Um, but maybe I should just not live for them. Who knows? Who knows? Um, maybe I'll just play after my dad gets off work. We'll see. We'll see. I also lost the cleaning cloth, so, like, I don't know how that's going to happen. Um, but I was having a fun time just twiddling away with it uh, right before we got started. So, let's see. Today's my long day of class, which is unfortunate for me. Okay. Oh, ha, ha, ha. My mom just sent me something about a trumpet section, and yet she doesn't appreciate my flute playing. Interesting how that works out. Okay, let's see what happened yesterday. Not a lot. I think basically Edward left, and um, Elmer was like, I'm not going to be super depressed like Marianne was, and so she's not. And Marianne's like, why aren't you super depressed? And Eleanor's like, because I'm trying not to be you. Um, and then they met the Mr. The Palmers. Um, Mrs. Palmer seems to be quite a little chattermouth, and Mr. Palmer seems to despise her every waking move. Uh, which is great for Mrs. Palmer. It's really funny, honestly. One of the funnier um, interactions in the book so far. Uh, Mrs. Palmer was like, well, we met Kurt. Oh my God, I just closed the book and there's no bookmark in it. <laughs> oh, it really do be like that sometimes. I think this is, I'm pretty, yes, this, we're, we're still good. I found it. No fear. No fear, Shakespeare. Um, She's like, okay, we saw Colonel Brandon, and he, like, said that your sister was engaged to Willoughby, and Eleanor is like, Colonel Brandon said that? And she's like, yeah, I was like, yeah, they're engaged, and he, like, didn't say anything, which means yes. And Eleanor is like, okay. Um, and essentially, Mrs. Palmer is just, like, really into getting these girls to come visit them. Um, and the girls are just, like trying very hard to judiciously like find a way to be like I don't want to do that <laughs> um but they're having a lot of trouble so who knows they might get roped into visiting the Palmers all right let's get started oh my god it's so late already what have I done Whew, okay chapter 21 the Palmers returned to Cleveland the next day and the two families at Barton were again left to entertain each other but this did not last long. Eleanor had hardly got their last visitors out of her head, had hardly done wondering at Charlotte's being so happy without a cause, and at Mr. Palmer's acting so simply with good abilities, and at the strange unsuitableness which often existed between husband and wife before Sir John's and Mrs. Jennings' active zeal in the cause of society procured her some other new acquaintance to see and observe. Excuse me. In the morning's excursion to Exeter, they had met with two young ladies, whom Mrs. Jennings had the satisfaction of discovering to be her relations, and this was enough for, for, for Sir John to invite them directly to the park, as soon as their present engagements at Exeter were over. Their engagements at Exeter instantly gave way before such an invitation, and Lady Middleton was thrown into no little alarm on the return of Sir John, by hearing that she was very soon to receive a visit from two girls whom she had never seen in her life, and whose elegance, whose tolerable gentility even, she could have no proof, for the assurance of her husband and mother on that subject went for nothing at all. 
There being her relations, too, made it so much the worse that Mrs. Jennings' attempts at cons consolation were therefore unfortunately founded when she advised her daughter not to care about their being so fashionable because they were all cousins and must put up with one another. As it was impossible, however, now to prevent their coming, Lady Middleton resigned herself to the idea of it with all the philosophy of a well-bred woman contenting herself with merely giving her husband a gentle reprimand on the subject five or six times every day. The young ladies arrived, their appearances, their appearance was by no means ungenteel or unfashionable. Their dresses, their dress was very smart, their manners very civil, they were delighted with the house and in raptures with the furniture, and they happened to be so dotingly fond of the children that Lady Middleton's good opinion was engaged in their favor before they had been an hour at the park. She declared them to be very agreeable girls indeed, which for her ladyship was enthusiastic admiration. Sir John's confidence in his own judgment rose with this animated praise, and he set off directly for the cottage to tell the Miss Dashwoods of the Miss Steele's arrival, and to assure them of their being the sweetest girls in the world. From such commendation at, as this, however, there was not much to be learned. Eleanor well knew that the sweetest girls in the world were to be met with in, in every part of England, under every possible variation of form, face, temper, and understanding. Sir John wanted the whole family to walk to the park directly and look at his guests. Benevolent philanthropic man. It was painful to, to him even to keep a third cousin to himself. Do come now, he said he. Pray come, you must come. I declare you shall come. You can't think how you will like them. Lucy is monstrous pretty and so good-humoured and agreeable. The children are all hanging about her already as if she was an old acquaintance. And they both long to see you of all things, for they have heard of ex Ugh. for they have heard of Exeter you are the most beautiful creatures in the world, and I have told them it is all very true and a great deal more. You will be delighted with them, I am sure. They have brought the whole coach full of playthings for the children. How can you be so cross as not to come? Why, they are your cousins, you know, after a fashion. You are my cousins, and they are my wife, so you must be related. But Sir John could not prevail. He could only obtain a promise of their calling at the park within a day or two, and then left them in amazement at their indifference to walk home and boast anew of their attractions to the Mrs. the Miss Steeles, as he had been already boasting of the Miss Steeles to them. When their promised visit to the park and consequent introduction to these young ladies took place, they found in the appearance of the eldest, who was nearly thirty, with a very plain and not a sensible face, nothing to admire. But in the other, who was no more than two or three and twenty, they acknowledged considerable beauty. Her features were pretty, and she had a sharp, quick eye and a smartness of air, which, though it did not give actual elegance or grace, gave distinction to her person. Their manners were particularly civil, and Eleanor soon allowed them credit for some kind of sense, when she saw with what constant and judicious attentions they were making themselves agreeable to Lady Middleton. With her children, they were in continual raptures, extolling their beauty, courting their notice, and humoring all their whims. And such of their time as could be spared for the important demands of what this politeness made on it was spent in admiration of whatever her ladyship was doing. If she happened to be doing anything or in taking patterns of some elegant new dress in which her appearance the day before had thrown them into unceasing delight. Fortunately, for those who pay their court through such foibles, a fond mother, though in pursuit of praise for her children, the most rapacious of human beings, is likewise the most credulous. Her demands are exorbitant, but she will swallow anything, and the excess of and the excess affection and endurance of the Miss Steeles toward her offspring were viewed, therefore, by Lady Middleton without the smallest surprise or distrust. She saw with maternal complacency all the impertinent encroachments and mischievous tricks to which her cousins submitted. She saw their sashes untied, their hair pulled about their ears, their work bags searched, and their knives and scissors stolen away, and felt no doubt of its being a reciprocal enjoyment. It suggested no other surprise than that Eleanor and Marianne should sit so composedly by, without claiming a share in what was passing. "'John is in such spirits today,' said she, on his taking Mrs. Steele's pocket handkerchief and throwing it out of a window. "'He is full of monkey tricks. 
And soon afterward, on the second boy's violently pinching one of the same lady's fingers, she fondly observed, How playful William is! And there is my sweet little Anna Maria, she added, tenderly caressing a little girl of three years old, who had not made a noise for the last two minutes. And she is always so gentle and quiet. Never was there such a quiet little thing. But unfortunately, in bestowing these embraces, a pin in her ladyship's headdress, slightly scratching the child's cheek, produced from this pattern of gentleness such violent screams as could hardly be outdone by any creature professedly noisy. The mother's consternation was excessive, but it could not surpass the alarm of the Miss Steeles, and everything was done by all three in so critical an emergency, which affection could suggest as likely to assure, assuage the agonies of the little sufferer. She was seated in her mother's lap, covered with kisses, her wound bathed with lavender water by one of the Miss Steeles, who was on her he knees to attend her, and her mouth stuffed with sugar plums by the other. With such a reward for her tears, the child was too wise to cease crying. She still screamed and sobbed lustily, kicked her two brothers for offering to touch her, and all their united soothings were ineffectual till Lady Middleton luckily remembered, remembering that in a scene of similar distress last week, some apricot marmalade had been successfully applied for a bruised temple. The same remedy was eagerly proposed for this unfortunate scratch, and a slight immersion of scream, intermission of screams in the young lady on hearing it gave them reason to hope it would not be rejected. <laughs> we love children. <laughs> she was carried out of the room, therefore, in her mother's arms, in quest of this medication, or whoops, this medicine. And as the two boys chose to follow, though earnestly entreated by their mother to stay behind, the four young ladies were left in a quietness which the room had not known for many hours. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> what a time. <laughs> Nothing happened, John, except for, um, a kid threw a fit. Poor little creature, said Miss Steele, as soon as they were gone. It might have been a very sad accident. Yet I hardly know how, cried Marianne, unless it had been under totally different circumstances. But this is the usual way of heightening alarm, where there is nothing to be alarmed at in reality. What a woman Lady Middleton is, said Lucy Steele. Marianne was silent. It was impossible for her to say what she did not feel, however trivial the occasion, and upon Eleanor, therefore, the whole task of telling lies when politeness required it always fell. She did her best when thus called on by speaking of Lady Middleton with more warmth than she felt, though with far less than Miss Lucy. And Sir John, too, cried the elder sister. What a charming man he is. Um... Here, too, Miss Dashwood's commendation, being only simple and just, came in without any eclat. It's like an eclair, but an eclat. Uh, maybe it's eclat. Who knows? <laughs> uh, she merely observed that he was perfectly good-humoured and friendly. And what a charming little family they have. I never saw such fine children in my life. I declare I quite dote upon them already, and indeed I am always distractedly fond of children. I should guess so, said Eleanor with a smile, from what I have witnessed this morning. I have a notion, said Lucy, that you think the little Middletons rather too much indulged. Perhaps they may be the outside of enough, but it is so natural in Lady Middleton, and for my part I love to see children in full of life and spirits. I cannot bear them if they are tame and quiet. I confess, replied Eleanor, that while, I'm at, while I am at Barton Park, I never think of tame and quiet children with any abhorrence. A short pause succeeded this speech, which was first broken by Miss Steele, who seemed very much disposed for conversation, and who now said rather abruptly, And how do you like Devonshire, Miss Dashwood? I suppose you were very sorry to leave Sussex. In some surprise at the familiarity of this question, or at least of the manner in which it was spoken, Eleanor replied that she was. Norland is, is a prodigious beautiful place, is it not? added Miss Steele. We have heard Sir John admire it excessively, said Lucy, who seemed to think some apology necessary for the freedom of her sister. 
I think everyone must admire it, replied Eleanor, for ever whoever saw the place, though it is not to be supposed that any one can estimate its beauties as we do. And is the and had you a great many smart bow there? I is it bow or bew? I think it's I don't know. <laughs> I'll give you both. <laughs> you choose. It's choose your own adventure here. Um I suppose you have you have not so many in this part of the world. For my part, I think they are a vast addition always. Bow. Like, like bow tie. Not bew, like Buford. <laughs> it was supposed to be Beaufort. <laughs> I guess it's bow. Okay. All right. Sophie's first French lesson. Baby's first French lesson. <laughs> um, okay. I think okay, I think okay, I don't know who's talking. But why should you think, said Lucy, looking ashamed of her sister, that there are not as many genteel young men in Devonshire as Sussex? Nay, my dear, I am sure I don't pretend to say there aren't. There ain't. Ant. It's literally spelled ant with an apostrophe between the N and the T. I'm sure there's a vast many smart bow in Exeter. Um, but you know how I could tell what smart bow there might be about Norland. And I was only afraid the Miss Dashwoods might find it dull at Barton if, you, if they had not so many as they used to have. But perhaps you young ladies may not care about the bow. I want to say bew, but I think it's wrong, according to Shiv. <laughs> um, as had, um, perhaps you young ladies may not care about the bow. <laughs> as it, as, and as, and had as life be without them as with them. For my part, I think they are vastly agreeable, provided they dress smart and behave civil. But I can't bear to see them dirty and nasty. Now there's Mr. Rose at Exeter, a prodigious smart young man, quite a beau. Oh, God. Now I think it's Bew because there's no X. Clerk to Mr. Simpson, you know. And yet, if you do not meet him of a morning, he is not fit to be seen. I suppose your brother was quite a Bew, Mrs. Dashwood, before he was married, as he was so rich. Upon my word, replied Eleanor, I cannot tell you, for I do not perfectly comprehend the meaning of the word. Me neither, Eleanor. Me neither. But this I can say, that if he ever was a bew before he married, he is one still, for there is not the smallest alteration in him. Oh, dear. One never thinks of married men's being beau. They have something else to do. There's B-E-U-X and B... Oh, shit. It's B-E-A-U-X and there's B-E-A-U. Jane Austen is really like, she's been doing pretty good this whole book, but let's just toss in a real passage to just blow it all. <laughs> um, Lord Anne, cried her sister, you can talk of nothing but Bubo. You will make Miss Dashwood believe you think of nothing else. And then turning the dis and then to turn the discourse, she began admiring the house and the furniture. This specimen of the Miss Steeles was enough. The vulgar freedom and folly of the eldest left her no recommendation, and as Eleanor was not blinded by the beauty or the shrewd look of the youngest to her want of real elegance and artlessness, she left the house without any wish of knowing them better. Not so the Miss Steeles. They came from Exeter well provided with admiration for the use of Sir John Middleton, his family, and all his relations, and no, I don't like that, um, and no proportion was now dealt out to his fair cousins, whom they declared to be the most beautiful, elegant, accomplished, and agreeable girls they had ever beheld, and with whom they were particularly anxious to be acquainted, to be better acquainted. And to be better acquainted, therefore, Eleanor soon found 
was their inevitable lot, for as Sir John was entirely on the side of the Miss Steeles, their party would be too strong for opposition, and that kind of intimacy must be submitted to, which consists of sitting an hour or two together in the same room almost every day. Sir John could do no more, but he did not think it, but he did not know that any more was required to be together. To be together was, in his opinion, to be intimate, and while his continual schemes for their meeting were effectual, he had not a doubt of their being established friends. To do him justice, he did everything in his power to promote their unreserved by making the Miss Steeles acquainted with whatever he knew or supposed of his cousin's situations in the most delicate particulars. Eleanor had not seen them more than twice before the eldest of them wished her joy on her sister's having been so lucky as to make a conquest of a very smart view since she came Barton. It will be a fine thing to have him married so young, to be sure, she, said she, and I hear he is quite a beau and prodigious handsome, and I hope you may have good as a good luck yourself soon, but perhaps you may have a friend in your cor in the corner already. Eleanor could not suppose that Sir John would be more nice in proclaiming his suspicions of her regard for Edward than he had been with respect to Marianne. Indeed, it was rather his favorite joke of the two as being somewhat newer and more conjectural, and since Edward's visit, they had never dined together without his drinking to her best affections with so much significancy and so many nods and winks as to excite general attention. The letter F had been likewise invariably brought forward and found productive of such countless jokes that its character as the wittiest letter in the alphabet had been long established with Eleanor. <laughs> Eleanor's just like, ah, the whole time. The Miss Steeles, as she expected, had now all the benefit of those jokes, and in the eldest of them, they raised a curiosity to know the name of the gentleman alluded to, which, though often impertinently expressed, was perfectly of a piece with her general inquis inquisitiveness into the concerns of their family. But Sir John did not sport long with the curiosity, which he delighted to raise, for he had at least as many pleasures, pleasure in telling the name as Miss Steele had in hearing it. His name is Ferris, he said in a very audible whisper, but pray do not tell it, for it is a great secret. Ferris, replied Mrs. Steele, Mr. Ferris is the happy man, is he? What, your sister's, your sister-in-law's brother, Miss Dashwood, a very agreeable young man, to be sure. I know him very well. How can you say so, Anne, cried Lucy, who generally made an amendment to all her sister's assertions. Though we have been, though we have seen him once or twice at my uncle's, it is rather too much to pretend to know him very well. Eleanor heard all this with attention and surprise. And who is this uncle? Where did he live? How, how came they acquainted? Uh, I don't think that was supposed to be in her voice, but I did it anyways. She wished very much to have the subject continued, though she did not choose to join in it herself. But nothing more of it was said, and for the first time in her life, she thought Mrs. Jennings deficient, either in curiosity after petty information, or in a disposition to communicate it. The manner in which Miss Steele had spoken of Edward increased her curiosity, for it struck her as being rather ill-natured and suggested the suspicion of that lady's knowing or fancying herself to know something to his disadvantage. But her curiosity was unavailing, for no farther notice was taken of Mr. Ferris's name by Miss Steele when alluded to, or even openly mentioned by Sir John. Chapter 22 Marianne, who had never much toleration for anything like impertinence, vulgarity, inferiority of parts, or even difference of taste from herself, was at this time particularly ill-disposed from the state of her spirits to be pleased with the Miss Steeles or to encourage their advances, and to the invariable coldness of her behavior towards them, which checked every endeavor at intimacy on their side, Eleanor principally attributed that preference of herself which soon became evident in the manners of both, but especially of Lucy, who missed no opportunity of engaging her in conversation or of striving to improve their acquaintance by an easy and frank communication of her sentiments. Lucy was naturally clever. Her remarks were often just and amusing, and as a companion for half an hour, Eleanor frequently found her agreeable. 
But her powers had received no aid from education, and she was ignorant and illiterate, and her deficiency of all mental improvement, her want of information in the most common particulars, could not be concealed from Miss Dashwood in spite of her constant endeavor to appear to advantage. Eleanor saw and pitied her her for, the neglect of abilities which education might have rendered so respectable, but she saw with less tenderness of feeling the thorough want of delicacy, of restitude, and integrity of mind which her attentions, her assiduities, her flatteries at the park betrayed, and she could have no lasting satisfaction in the company of a person who joined in sincerity with ignorance, whose want of instruction prevented their meeting in conversation on terms of equality, and whose conduct towards others made every show of attention and deference toward herself perfectly valueless. Woof! You will think by question an odd one, I dare say, said Lucy to her one day when they were walking together from the park to the cottage. But pray, are you personally acquainted with your sister-in-law's mother, Mrs. Ferris? Eleanor did think the question a very odd one, and her countenance expressed it as she answered that she had never seen Mrs. Ferris. Indeed, replied Lucy. I wonder at that, for I thought you must have seen her at Norland sometimes. Then perhaps you cannot tell me what sort of a woman she is. No, returned Eleanor, cautious, cautious of giving her real opinion of Edward's mother, and not very desirous of satisfying what seemed impertinent curiosity. I know nothing of her. I am sure you think me very strange for inquiring about her in such a way, said Lucy, eyeing Eleanor attentively as she spoke. But perhaps there may be reasons. I wish I might venture, but, however, I hope you will do me the justice of believing I do not mean to be impertinent. I think, I don't know if it's a class thing, I don't know enough about Regency, but I feel like you just didn't need to be educated at all if you were a woman um, of a certain class. I guess any class, I don't know how well-educated and lower-class people were in these days either. But I think, like, as long as you can sew and design a room, like, you're set. Like, that's all men want, right? Um, who cares if you can read a book? Um, which sucks. That's, that was actually, like, one of the saddest passages in the book. Um, I don't even remember what, what just happened. Um, I cannot bear to think, to have you think me impertinent and curious. I am sure I would rather do anything in the world than be thought so by a person whose good opinion is so well worth having as yours. And I am sure I should not have the smallest fear of trusting you. Indeed, I should be very glad of your advice how to manage in such an uncomfortable situation as I am. But, however, there is no occasion to trouble you. I am sorry you do not happen to know Mrs. Ferris. I am sorry I do not, said Eleanor in great astonishment, if it could be to any use of you to know my opinion to her. But really, I never understood that you were all at all connected with the fa that family, and therefore I am a little surprised, I confess, at so serious an inquiry into her character. I dare say you are, and I am sure that I do not all at, at all wonder at it. But if I dared to tell you all, you would be not... Damn. You would not be so much surprised. Mrs. Ferris is certainly nothing to me at present, but the time may come. How soon it will come must depend upon herself, when we may be very in intimately connected. She looked down as she said this, amiably bashful, with only one side glance at her companion to observe its effect on her. Good heavens! Mm -hmm. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh, boy. Good heavens, cried Eleanor. What do you mean? Are you acquainted with Mr. Robert Ferris? Can you be? And she did not feel much delighted with the idea of such a sister-in-law. No, replied Lucy, not to Mr. Robert Ferris. I never saw him in my life. Fixing her eyes upon Eleanor. To his elder brother. Is that Edward? What felt Eleanor at this moment? I think my little scream just encapsulated it. Um, astonishment, that would have been as painful as it was strong, had not an immediate disbelief of the assertion attended it. 
She turned towards Lucy in silent amazement, unable to divine the reason or object of such a declaration. And though her complexion varied, she stood firm in incredulity and felt in no danger of hysterical fit or a swoon. You may be surprised, well surprised, you may well be surprised, continued Lucy, for to be sure you could have had no idea of it before, and I dare say he never dropped the smallest hint of it to you or any of your family, because it was always meant to be a great secret, and I am sure has been faithfully kept so by me to this hour. Not a soul of my relations know of it but Anne, and I never should have mentioned it to you if I had not felt the greatest dependence in the world upon your secrecy. And I really thought my behavior in asking so many questions about Mrs. Ferris must seem so odd that it ought to be explained. And I do not think Mr. Ferris can be displeased when he knows I have trusted you, because I know he has the highest opinion in the world of all your family and looks upon yourself and the other Miss Dashwoods quite as his own sisters. Ah! No, I still think it's, I still think she's saying that they're connected. Eleanor paused, uh, she paused. Eleanor for a few moments remained silent. Her astonishment at what she had heard was at first too great for words, but it, oh my God, I read ahead, I read ahead. Eleanor felt for a few moments remained silent. Her astonishment at what she heard was at first too great for words, but at length forcing herself to speak and to speak cautiously, she said with a calmness of manner which, tolerably well concealed her surprise and solicitude. May I ask if your engagement is of long standing? We have been engaged these four years. Four years! <laughs> that's the next, that's Eleanor's next line too. <laughs> four years. Eleanor, though greatly shocked, still felt unable to believe it. I did not know, she said she, that you were even acquainted to the other day. Our acquaintance, our acquaintance, however, is of many years' date. He was under my uncle's care, you know, a considerable while. Your uncle? Yes, Mr. Pratt. Did you ever hear him talk of Mr. Pratt? I think I have, replied Eleanor, with exertion of spirits which increased with her increase of her of emotion. He was four years with my uncle, who lives at Longstaple near Plymouth. It was there our acquaintance began, for my sister and me was often staying. My sister and me was often. Oy. <laughs> oh no! Um, though not till. Oh, shit, I'm sorry. It was there our acquaintance begun, for my sister and me was often staying with my uncle, and it was there our engagement was formed, though not till a year after he had quitted as a pupil, but he was almost always with us afterwards. I was very unwilling to enter into it, into it, as you may imagine, without the knowledge and approbation of his mother, but I was too young and loved him too well to be so prudent as I ought to have been. Though you do not know him so well as me, Miss Dashwood, you must have seen enough of him to be sensible. He is very capable of making a woman sincerely attached to him. Certainly, answered Eleanor, without knowing what she said. But after a moment's reflection, she added, with revived security of Edward's honor and love, and her companion's falsehood, engaged to Mr. Edward Ferris, I confess myself so totally surprised at what you tell me, that really... I beg your pardon, but surely there must be some mistake of personal name. We cannot mean the same Mr. Ferris. <laughs> we can mean no other, cried Lucy, smiling. Mr. Edward Ferris, the eldest son of Mrs. Ferris of Park Street, and brother of your sister-in-law, Mrs. John Dashwood, is the person I mean. You must allow that I am not likely to be deceived as to the name of the man on whom all my happiness depends. Eleanor is like, <laughs> oh my God, I feel so bad. I've been hit like this before, Eleanor. <laughs> so many times. Wow. Um, it is strange, replied Eleanor, in a most painful perplexity, that I should never have heard him even mention your name. No, considering our situation, it is not strange. 
Our first care has been to keep the matter secret. You knew nothing of me or my family, and therefore there could be no occasion for ever mentioning my name to you. As he was always particularly afraid of his sister suspecting anything, that was the reason enough for his not mentioning it. She was silent. Eleanor's security sunk, but her self-command did not sink with it. Four years you have been engaged, she said with a firm voice. Yes, and heaven knows how much longer we may have to wait. Poor Edward, it puts him quite out of heart. Then taking a small miniature from her pocket, she added, to prevent the possibility of mistake, be so good as to look at his face. It does not do him justice, to be sure, but yet I think you cannot be deceived as to the person it was drew for. I have had it about above these three years. And she put it into her hands as she spoke, and when Eleanor saw the painting, whatever other doubts, her fear of too hasty of a too hasty decision, or her wish of detecting falsehood might suffer to linger in her mind, she could have none of its being Edward's face. She returned it almost instantly, acknowledging the likeness. It's not over till it's over. I have never been able, continued Lucy, to give him my picture in return, which I am very much vexed for, for he has been always so anxious to get it. But I am determined to set for it the very first opportunity. You are quite in the right, replied Eleanor calmly. Then they proceeded a few paces in silence. Lucy spoke first. I am sure, said she, I have no doubt in the world of your faithfully keeping this secret, because you must know of what importance it is to us not to have it reached his mother, for she would never approve of it, I dare say. I shall have no fortune, and I fancy she is an exceedingly proud woman. I certainly did not seek your confidence, said Eleanor, but you do me no more than justice in imagining that I may be depended on. Your secret is safe with me. Pardon me if I express some surprise at so unnecessary a communication. You must at least have left that my being acquainted with it could not add to its safety. Eleanor's like, why did you tell me this? <laughs> why? <laughs> oh my God, I just popped my jaw. <laughs> um, as she said this, looked earnestly at Lucy, hoping to discover something in her countenance, perhaps a falsehood of the greatest part of what she had been saying. But Lucy's countenance suffered no change. I was afraid you would think I was taking a great liberty with you, she, said she, in telling you all this. I have not known you long, to be sure, personally at least. But I have known you and all your family by description a great while, and as soon as I saw you, I felt almost as if you was an old acquaintance. Besides, in the present case, I really thought some explanation was due to you after my making such particular inquiries about Edward's mother, and I am so unfortunate that I am not a creature whose advice I can ask. Anne is the only person who knows of it, and she has no judgment at all. Indeed, she does me a great deal more harm than good, for I am in constant fear of her betraying me. She does not know how to hold her tongue, as you must perceive, and I am sure I was in the greatest fright in the world to the other day, when Edward's name was mentioned by Sir John, lest she should out with it all. You can think how much I go through in my mind from it altogether. I only wonder that I am alive after what I have suffered for Edward's sake these last four years. Everything in such suspense and uncertainty, and seeing him so seldom, we can hardly meet above twice a year. I am sure I wonder my heart is not quite broke. Well, somebody's heart is surely broken in this situation. He took a, she, here she took out her handkerchief, but Eleanor did not feel very compassionate, as is your right, boo. <laughs> Burned down his house. <laughs> Sometimes, continued Lucy after wiping her eyes, I think whether it would not be better for us both to break off the matter entirely. Eleanor's like, yeah, that would be really good. <laughs> As she said this, she looked directly at her companion. But then at other times, I have no resolution enough for it. I cannot bear the thoughts of making him so miserable. And I know the very mention of such a thing would do. And on my own account, too, so dear as he is to me, I don't think I could be equal to it. What would you advise me to do in such a case, Miss Dashwood? What would you do yourself? And then I was like, um, I would break up with him super fast. Just really fast. <laughs> As Edward knew that. 
I think so. Um, wow. And to think I was waxing poetic upon Edward's merits, and yet here he is, turned out to be nothing but a man. <laughs> um, Pardon me, replied Eleanor, startled by the question, but I can give you no advice under such circumstances. Your own judgment must direct you. To be sure, continued Lucy, after a few minutes of silence on both sides, his mother must provide for him some time or other, but poor Edward is so cast down about it. Did you not think him dreadful low-spirited when he was at Barton? He was so miserable when he left us at Longstaple to go to you that I was afraid you would think him quite ill. Did he come from your uncle's then when he visited us? Oh, yes. He had been staying a fortnight with us. Did you think he came directly from town? No, replied Eleanor, feeling sensible of every fresh circumstance in favor of Lucy's veracity. I remember he told us that he had been staying a fortnight with some friends near Plymouth. She remembered, too, her own surprise at the time, at his mentioning nothing farther of those friends, at his total silence with respect even to their names. Did you not think him um, sadly out of spirits, repeated Lucy. We did indeed, particularly so when he first arrived. I begged him to exert himself for fear you should suspect what was the matter, but it made him so melancholy not being able to stay more than a fortnight with us and seeing me so much affected. Poor fellow, I am afraid it is just the same with him now, for he writes in wretched spirits. I heard from him just before now, I left, uh, just before I left Exeter, taking a letter from her pocket and carelessly showing the direction to Eleanor. You know his hand, I dare say, a charming one it is, but that is, that is not written so well as usual. He was tired, I dare say, for he just filled out, filled the sheet to me as full as possible. Eleanor saw that it was his hand, and she could doubt no longer. The picture she had allowed herself to believe might have been accidentally obtained. It might not have been Edward's gift, but a correspondence between them by letter could subsist only under a positive engagement, could be authorized by nothing else. For a few, for a few moments, she was almost overcome. Her heart sunk within her, and she could hardly stand. But exertion was so indispensably necessary that she struggled so resolutely against the oppression of her feelings that her success was speedy for the time complete. Writing to each other, said Lucy, returning the letter into her pocket, is the only comfort we have in long separations. Yes, I have one other comfort in his picture, but poor Edward has not even that. If he had but my picture, he said he should be easy. I gave him a lock of my hair set in a ring when he was at Longstaple last, and that was some comfort to him, he said, but not equal to a picture. Perhaps you might notice the ring when you saw him. I did, said Eleanor, with composure of voice, under which was concealed an emotion and distress beyond anything she had ever felt before. She was mortified, shocked, confused. Fortunately for her, they had now reached the cottage, and the conversation could be continued no farther. After sitting with them a few minutes, the Miss Steeles returned to the park, and Eleanor was at liberty to think and be wretched. Wow! What a chapter! What a complete decimation! That was incredible! I totally forgot that plot twist completely divorced from my mind. That's crazy. I am ready to burn Edward's house down. Remember all those nice things we said about Edward? I take them all back. That was like, I honestly, I mean, I, I consume a lot of media, but I've never, like that happened, the thing where like, she like, oh yeah, he definitely likes me. And then it's like, oh no, he was actually engaged to a different woman the whole time. That happens to me literally, and I'm like not even exaggerating, all the time. And I've never like seen it writ so well. And I've never seen it like extrapolated upon. Like she have, it happens like on the daily, not on the daily. Um, it's my own fault mostly, but also kind of their fault. Um, Anyways, I think she should burn down his house. Um, but also, knowing me, she's going to be like, oh my god, I'm so stupid. Like, how could I even think that? Oh, baby girl, this is not fun. I love that. Gave her opportunity to think and be wretched. Yep, that's me. 
<laughs> wow, that's that was beautiful. I can't wait. So that was actually the end of the first volume. And now we have two more volumes to go. So tomorrow we'll start on volume two, chapter one. Exciting, exciting, exciting stuff. We love people getting wrecked by untruthful men. I'm so mad. <laughs> Let's go beat Edward up. All right, we're forming a, a beating Edward up party. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Wow, that was great. That was really, that was really fantastic. I loved that for me. Okay. I'm leaving now. That long, long two chapters. Okay, um, I'm gonna run off so I can get ready for class. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Tomorrow is Wednesday. I will be in at 4.15. Okie dokie. See you then. Bye.